Hello and welcome to Intermediate Financial Accounting 1, Tutorial 22A. This is the first of two tutorials focused on accounting for impairment of property, plant, and equipment. This tutorial focuses on impairment of PPE under ASPE or ASPE. Tutorial 22B will focus on impairment of PPE under IFRS. There are two learning objectives for this tutorial. First is to review how to determine if impairment of property, plant, and equipment, or PPE, is evident under ASPE using the recoverability test. And two, to review how to calculate impairment of PPE under ASPE. This tutorial is based on the Vader Corp example, so please download the correct file which contains the data and requirements for Vader and review that information in advance so you can follow along. This tutorial will focus on requirement one, which is basically assuming that VEDA reports under ASPE to determine the impairment adjustment and record the appropriate journal entry, if required, under each of the following scenarios. So the first scenario we'll look at is where the expected undiscounted future cash flows are 25,000 per year over the remaining useful life and the cost to dispose of the asset at the time will be 45,000. The second scenario is virtually identical except that the expected undiscounted future cash flows are 50,000 per year. So the first step involved is conducting the ASPE recoverability test, and that includes comparing the carrying value to the undiscounted future cash flows. The first thing we'll have to do is calculate the carrying value of the asset. The carrying value is also known as the net book value. And you'll recall from previous work you've done that the carrying value, or NBV, is simply the cost minus accumulated depreciation. The problem is we don't know the accumulated depreciation, so we're going to have to calculate it. The data in this problem says that the company uses double declining balance amortization. But you are not told what the double declining balance rate is. Quite often, students think that they have to be told the double declining balance rate, and that's not correct. You actually only need to be told what the useful life of the asset is. So double declining balance depreciation or amortization is simply twice the declining balance rate. Well, how do you figure the declining balance rate of depreciation? It's simply one over the useful life. The useful life is 50 years. We take one over 50 years. The declining balance rate is 2%. Therefore, the double declining balance rate is twice times 2%, so 4%. So that's what we're going to use to calculate the accumulated depreciation is 4% double declining balance. Now also note that the ASPE standard only requires impairment testing when changes or events or certain changes in circumstances suggest that impairment might be present. So it doesn't have to be done annually, only when uh, circumstances dictate that impairment may be present. What we're going to do now is calculate the accumulated amortization and I apologize if I use amortization and depreciation interchangeably throughout the tutorial. Remember that with ASPE, the correct terminology is actually amortization, and under IFRS, the uh, correct term is depreciation. With double declining balance amortization, we can easily calculate the carrying value at the end of any year based on this following little calculation. The carrying value is equal to the cost times one minus the double the declining balance rate to the exponent of n, where n is the number of years that have passed. So if we want to know what the carrying value in 2020 is, we take the cost of 2,250,000 times 1 minus 0 0.04, which is 0.96, to the exponent of six years, and that's 2020 through 2025 inclusive. So that means that the carrying value at the end of 2020 should be $1,761,205. And then if we want to figure out what the accumulated depreciation is on that, we simply take the cost minus the carrying value. Notice that we are, this is not the calculation of the actual accumulated depreciation here. This is the calculation of the carrying value. So to figure out the accumulated depreciation, we would need to take our 2250 minus the carrying value to give us 488,795. So that is the accumulated depreciation or accumulated amortization of the asset. If you are unsure of the calculation to reach the carrying value, you can always do a proof the long way, and that's to take the cost of 2.25 million and then multiplying by the remaining unamortized amount every year, so times 0.96, which is 1 minus 0 0.4. And if you keep multiplying that by 0 0.6, times 0 0.6, 0 0.6, 6 times, you'll get 1,761,205. So this is the long way to calculate the carrying value, and this is uh, over here the short way.
What we have here then is, if we've determined that the accumulated amortization is 488,795, that translates to 488,795. If we take the cost, uh, minus 488,795 gives us our carrying value, which is what we've calculated here. So all this slide does is just kind of bring it full circle so you can see how the carrying value is determined. And if you ever needed to figure out what the accumulated depreciation is, you'd work backwards from the cost. Continuing on with the first part of the test, um, now that we know what the carrying value is, we can look at factor in now the undiscounted future cash flows. We're going to do both of these scenarios sort of at the same time. Remember that scenario A has annual undiscounted future cash flows of 25,000, scenario B is 50,000. The idea was just to provide a different scale. Now we want to convert our annual undiscounted future cash flows to total undiscounted future cash flows. Under scenario A, that will require us to take our annual payment of 25,000 and multiply by 44 periods or 44 years. And the reason why it's 44 is because from the initial 50 years, six years have passed. So there are 44 years remaining. And then we subtract the 45,000 in costs that are expected to be incurred to dispose of the asset. If we take 25,000 times 44, and then subtract 45,000 from that result, we'll have 1,055,000 in total undiscounted future cash flows for scenario A. And scenario B, the only thing that changes, of course, is the cash flow goes from 25 to 50,000 in this scenario. So we'll multiply also by 44 periods and then subtract the expected cost to dispose of the asset and will give us a present value of $2,155,000. So then we just bring the carrying value back in. We've already calculated this a couple of slides ago, and it's the same under both scenarios. So again, the carrying value of $1,761,205. So now is where we do a little bit of a comparison to determine what we have. Is the carrying value greater than the undiscounted future cash flows? So UCF, and here we've defined UCF as being undiscounted cash flows, and the carrying value CB. If the carrying value or CV is greater than the UCF, under scenario A, the carrying value of 1,761,205 is greater than 1,055,000. But here under scenario B, the carrying value is not higher. So the carrying value is less than the total undiscounted future cash flows of 2,155,000. So now is where we actually conduct our recoverability tests since we've compared the carrying value to the undiscounted future cash flows. What we're trying to do here is determine if the carrying value of the asset is recoverable based on the future cash flows. If the carrying value is greater than the sum of the undiscounted future cash flows, the carrying value will not be recovered through the undiscounted future cash flows, which means that this thing has a carrying value of 1,761,205, but the cash flows expected to be generated by it are 1,055,000. Therefore, the asset is impaired. That's not the calculation of how much the asset is to be impaired, it simply is impaired. But if we look at the second scenario, the carrying value of 1,061,205 is exceeded by the undiscounted future cash flows of 2,155. So this just means that the sum of all of the future cash flows will exceed the carrying value. Therefore, the future cash flows will enable us to recover the carrying value. So we are recoverable and therefore not impaired. So in a situation where the carrying value is not recoverable through the future cash flows, we have impairment. And in the situation where the carrying value is less than the undiscounted future cash flows, we do not have impairment. If you're wondering here then, to, just to confirm, we can calculate what the difference is to show that it's negative. If we take our undiscounted future cash flows of 1,055,000 and subtract the carrying value, this gives us a negative balance of 706,205. That difference is negative, so impairment exists, but this is not the calculation of the impairment, and that comes next. Step one was conducting the recoverability test. Step two now is actually calculating the impairment under ASPE. This top part just summarizes what we had before, right? We've determined that the asset is impaired under scenario A, but not impaired under scenario B, which means that uh, we're not gonna have to calculate any impairment under scenario B, but we will under scenario A, which is based on the $25,000 annual cash flows.
to calculate our impairment, we're going to take the fair value excluding disposal costs. These are important things to, to recognize when you include and exclude because when we do this under IFRS, we will have to remove or deduct the disposal costs, but ASPE does not. So ASPE will take the fair value of the asset, excluding any disposal costs, less the carrying value. The data tells us that the fair value of the asset is $795,000. Then if we take the carrying value, 795,000 minus 1,761,205, that results in an impairment of $966,205. Note that this is not the same as the difference that was used for the recoverability test. And that's a part that confuses a lot of students. A lot of them assume that once they've conducted the recoverability test, that the difference between the carrying value and the undiscounted future cash flows, well, that's just what the impairment is. It's not the same as the recoverability test. Then the last thing to do is record a journal entry. So we're going to debit loss on impairment. That hits the income statement for 966,205. And we'll credit accumulated impairment losses for the same 966,205. This acts as a contra account to uh, the assets so that we can see what the original cost was, but still allow us to accumulate any impairment losses if the asset continues to be impaired. And ASPE does allow for recovery of some impairment losses if the conditions or future cash flows change such that the amount of impairment later on is, is not as high as it was previously. So now some key points to remember. First, always conduct a recoverability test before attempting to calculate and record impairment. Remember, those are different things. So the ASPE recoverability test is the carrying value versus the undiscounted future cash flows. If the carrying value is less than the undiscounted future cash flows, then we do not have impairment. But if the carrying value is greater than the undiscounted cash flows, then we do have impairment. Next, if impairment is evident, then we would calculate the impairment as the fair value less the carrying value, or if we use letters to denote that, FV for fairing value minus CV for carrying value. You can flip this around and take carrying value minus fair value. If you do it the way presented here, you'll end up with a negative value as a result, and as long as you know to interpret that as an absolute value, if that represents a loss, you're fine. Uh, also, ASPE does not uh, deduct disposal costs in the determination of fair value, whereas IFRS does. That's a common mistake made by students. Finally, under ASPE, impairment losses cannot be reversed. So once we've impaired an asset, that's it. We can't go back. So this concludes tutorial 22A on impairment of PPE assets under ASPE. You should proceed to tutorial 22B to review impairment of PPE under IFRS.